Uh, Father, we thank you so much again for allowing us to gather here to worship you. Uh, we ask you, Father, that your presence is here with us and that you will move in the hearts of every member here, Lord. We ask of you, Father God, that you are the one to do the work in our hearts. And I ask of you, Father God, that your presence will move in here strongly. And uh, may we worship you and praise you as a congregation, as one voice, Lord. Thank you so much, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus died for 
how amazing is it that he has saved us? The fact that he wanted to deliver us, no matter our circumstance, no matter who we are, no matter what we did, that's that grace. And to sing this song, such a simple song that we have always sang our whole lives, right? Let's feel that in our hearts right now to just know and thank him for delivering us for the amazing grace that he has for us. Let's sing amazing grace. Amazing grace How sweet the sound that Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us all here today. Bless us with all your love, will, and glory. Um, please give us all the strength that you have and let us come to you, Lord. Go Chiefs, amen. morning. <clears throat> Just want to say this church does not officially endorse the Chiefs <laughs> or the Niners. Only the Lions. 
next year. Amen. Well, praise God. Thank you, praise team, for leading us into God's presence. Um, I really feel him. When we lift up Jesus, he's there in our midst. So, praise God. So, back in high school, there was a guy on our track team that we knew only as the Beast. That was his nickname. And this guy was a middle distance runner, 800 meters, 400 meters, and he was the best uh, runner at those distances in our state. And so whenever we had a track meet, uh, we felt invincible when he was on the track. When he was in a relay, it didn't matter how far behind we were in a 4x400 relay, we knew that at the end, the anchor leg, the beast, would bring home the victory. And so uh, he was one year above me, and, and so my whole time running track, we just celebrated the beast. And uh, whenever he rounded the turn on a track, we would just yell, beast! And so um, I didn't even know what his real name was. I just, <laughs> he was the beast. And, um, and it's funny because he, he then graduated and I looked in our yearbook, his senior yearbook, uh, I wanted to look up the beast. And uh, I found out what his name was. And under his name, there's a little senior message. And this is what he wrote for his senior message. He said, to all who knew me as the beast, I was always just Nalo boy. This was in Hawaii. Nalo means Waima Nalo. And he just... Um, so Nalo Boy is just somebody from Waimanalo, um, very small kind of beach community. And I was shocked to find out that this guy that I'd been calling the Beast didn't see himself as the Beast. He saw himself as Nalo Boy, as just a simple, simple guy from a, the sticks, from like a countryside in Hawaii. It's funny how the way people see us and define us, even the nicknames they give us, are not always who we are, right? They're not always who we are. I was in a, a young adult group at church, and we were saying who in the Star Wars universe each person was. And one girl got to me, and she said, you're C-3PO. And I was so insulted. <laughs> because I saw myself as Qui-Gon Jinn, like a warrior. But she saw me as this very friendly, diplomatic person, which I am, to be, to be truthful. But, but um, yeah, I, I just, I said, no, I'm not C-3PO. But I might very well be C-3PO. The things that people call us, the way people see us, is not always who we are. I want to read, um, and, and so, um, how do we know who we are? How do we know who we are? Um, how do we have an identity? How, we, how do we understand uh, who we are when the crowds say we're something else? One of the most important spiritual disciplines, we're still in a series on spiritual disciplines, one of the most important spiritual disciplines for becoming a mature Christian, and not just a mature Christian, but just a mature person, is practicing the spiritual discipline of solitude. Solitude. And we're going to explain what that is and how to do it. But um, let's read from the Bible, Luke chapter 5, verses 15 through 16. And it says there, Yet the news about him, about Jesus, spread all the more, so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. The crowds came to Jesus and they defined Jesus and they looked at Jesus and they saw Jesus as a healer and a miracle worker. 
They love Jesus without fully understanding him. They love Jesus because of what he did, of the things he accomplished, the things that he did for them. And this is how people are, is that we often look at one another, we look at people by their usefulness to us. We define people according to their usefulness to us. A lot of times we introduce each other by our careers, our jobs. We define one another according to one another's usefulness to others. So we're constantly being defined by other people. And that's what people wanted to do to Jesus. They wanted to define Jesus as a healer and a miracle worker. But that's not only who Jesus was. Jesus knew that he was the Son of God. Jesus knew that his ultimate mission on earth was not simply to heal people's diseases. That was part of it. But Jesus knew that ultimately his mission was to go to the cross and to give his life for the sins of the world. And so he had to practice the spiritual discipline of solitude. He had to get away from the crowds who wanted to define him as a healer and miracle worker, and he had to withdraw to lonely places and pray to spend time with God. He had to, he had to make time to be alone with God because it's only in being alone with God that Jesus could fully remember and understand and, and remind himself of who he was. Of who he was. You want to know who you are? Only God can tell you who you are. You want to know who you are? You, you want to understand your self-identity? You can't define that. Only your creator defines that. And that's why we have to get God's opinion about who we are. Because the crowds will define us. The crowds will say, you're the beast, or you're something, you're, you're C-3PO, which I reject. Um, <laughs> the crowds will define you, and you can't let that be the primary way you understand yourself. Because the crowds can't define you, you can't even define yourself, only God, your creator, the one who made you on purpose, only he can define you. And, and a lot of times, let's be real, crowds get it wrong. Crowds get it wrong. Crowds, um, they love you one minute and they hate you the next. That's what happened to Jesus. They celebrated him until they realized he was not the miracle worker that, that they thought he was, that he was really the son of, you know, he claimed to be the son of God, the king of Israel, a spiritual king, and ultimately a sacrificial lamb. Jesus didn't trust the crowds. He didn't he was never swayed by the crowds. It didn't matter if the crowds loved him. It didn't matter if the crowds hated him. It didn't matter what the crowds thought of him or tried to define him as. He always had a self-identity in God. And he, and he strengthened himself in that through solitude. Here's the thing. Crowds of people can be dangerous. Crowds of people can be um, not smart. One of my favorite quotes in, in cinema is from the movie Men in Black. And um, it's this profound line that Agent K says. He says, a person is smart, people are dumb. A person is smart, people are dumb. Truer, truer words were rarely ever spoken in cinema. A person, uh, you take a person by themselves and they're smart, they, they're reasonable. You put them in a group and all, all of a sudden they lose reason. There's this phenomenon called um, groupthink. And this was developed by a social psychologist in the 70s, Irving, um, Irving Janis. And groupthink is this tendency for people in groups, um, in certain types of groups where cohesion, harmony, agreement is the primary important thing. There's this tendency in groups that, that have high levels of cohesion to devolve into groupthink, where bad ideas carry the day, where wrong ideas take over the group. And you might pull each individual aside and maybe they don't agree with that, 
the bad idea, the wrong idea, a racist ideology, a violent ideology, a mob mentality. You might pull an individual aside and say, hey, what do you think? And they might say, I don't agree with that. But in the group, in the group, that smartness goes away because people, uh, most people prefer harmony to truth. And they want to keep the peace rather than uphold what's right. And you'll see that sometimes, um, they found that in groups. Do you know who eventually gets listened to? There, there's three main things. If they speak first, the earlier somebody speaks in a discussion, the more they're listened to. The higher their status, if they're the leader or if they have high group status, the more they're listened to. If they speak a lot, volume of, not volume, uh, quantity of speech carries the day. So if you want to convince a group, just speak up first and speak a lot. And you, you can convince a lot of people. Now, that's fine if, if that person has the best idea, right? But that's dangerous if they're wrong. There was a, when I was growing up in fifth grade, um, there was a huge event, a disaster that happened. Uh, the, space, uh, the space shuttle Challenger blew up 70 seconds after launch, and it was on live TV. And I still remember uh, the class talking about it that day um, when we got to school. Seven people were killed on, on live TV. And um, that's brought up as a classic example of groupthink. Because the NASA organization was structured in such a way that groupthink was all but unavoidable. Because the leaders of the space shuttle program, they were so pressured to deliver timely launches that they were pressuring their engineers to overlook significant safety issues. This was, this was part of the process. Like, you know, they would even phrase questions. The bosses would phrase questions to their engineers saying, hey, that's probably not a problem, right? That's, that shouldn't be a problem, right? They were so pushy about the deadlines, they overlooked many safety warnings that the engineers were telling them, like, this is not safe. They, the leaders heard this time and time again, this is not safe. Even the day before, the launch, the engineers were saying, the O-rings, it's too cold, it's, record, it's a record cold day. The O-rings are not gonna seal. And because of the pressure of delivering a launch, they overlooked all of those warnings. And nobody put, put up a, a stink. They all just went along with it because of groupthink. In today's day and age, Groupthink has the potential to devastate society when misinformation, bad ideas, wrong ideas rise to the top and take the day simply through volume, simply through repeated exposure, simply through people of status. And I feel like never before was there a need for, um, for people to think for themselves to be independent thinkers. Um, I forgot this definition. Here's a definition by the guy who really pioneered this. Um, Groupthink is the mode of thinking that persons engage in when concurrence seeking becomes so dominant in a cohesive in-group that it tends to override realistic appraisal of alternative course of action. If you're ever in a group and everybody is just agreeing, that's dangerous. If you're in a business and you and all your staff are agreeing all the time, you're headed for disaster. Um, so so the, uh, the, the solution for that, so in, in this book, The Wisdom of Crowds, James Sirwicky uh, writes, paradoxically, the best way for a group to be smart is for each person in it to think and act as independently as possible. 
for each person to take responsibility for seeing the truth, for seeing what's right, for seeing what's best, and being willing to speak up for that. That there's two qualities that protect a group from groupthink, diversity and independence. The more diverse your group is, the stronger you are. The more independent each person in your group is, the stronger you are. This, is not, this doesn't mean that there's, there's constantly conflict, it's just everybody thinking independently for the, for the good of the group, trying to figure out what's best. So, um, I can, I attend, we had a church council meeting yesterday and I thought it was a great church council meeting because we have very independent thinkers in leadership at our church. Maybe sometimes too much, but um, no, it was really healthy. It was really healthy. I was pleased because uh, many people were speaking up, diverse opinions, diverse perspectives, and that's protective. That's a protective quality of this church, that we, we are protected from groupthink in many ways. So, good stuff, good stuff. Um, on a personal level, what we want to move towards is individuation, individuation. Um, this, this is a psychological concept. Um, it's Jungian, Carl Jung really pioneered this concept. Actually, in, in Jungian th psychology, the main theme of his psychology is individuation. Individuation is not individualism, it's, it's, that, it's that process by which a person becomes a whole person, becomes themselves, um, is able to overcome and shed false personas. Because we all have false personas we put up to deal with people. But the more you can understand who you are, embrace who you are, and be who you are, the more you individuate. And, and the more you individuate, the, the healthier you are, the more mature you are, and the better you are for society. And, um, and, and I believe, as Christians especially, one of the healthiest ways that we can learn to individuate um, is solitude. So solitude frees us from the cry of the crowds and allows us to hear God's whisper within. In solitude, we come to know God and ourselves. Solitude, where we learn how to understand ourselves free from the crowds, free from the pressures of other people. You young people, you, you start individuating early, like in adolescence, right? You start rebelling. Parents, you've seen your, your young people start you know, doing their own thing, thinking their own thoughts, um, having their own political opinions that are completely different from yours, deciding what they're going to wear despite your protests. Um, they're individuating, and it's healthy. They need to do that. Young people, you need to learn how to understand yourself and define yourself not by your family, your parents, or even by your peer group, because that's what we do as teenagers, right? We define ourselves by our peer group. We define ourselves by who we hang out with, with our music. But if you want to be a mature person, you need to start even learning how to individuate from your peer group and to be your own person. So, so ultimately, Jesus is my model and my example. He was the ultimately mature, individuated person. He was a whole person. It didn't matter whether he was talking to rich people, poor people, um, in crowd, out crowd, uh, religious leaders, unreligious people, he was the same. He was just himself. And he thought so independently. The whole crowd could be shouting one thing and he would just think another thing. To the point where they killed him for that. For thinking that he was the son of God and that people needed forgiveness not just military conquest. So Jesus is my model, and, and a recurring theme in the life of Jesus is this practice of solitude. A recurring theme in the life of Jesus is he would often hide from people, steal away from people, get away from people, get away from the crowds, 
so that he could have his time alone with God. Those who practice this and become fully individuated are the people that are of greatest benefit to society. You can help people and others and the church most by being most who God created you to be. And so the purpose of solitude, the purpose of individuation is not for our self-realization only, but it's so that we could be of utmost service to our community. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Life Together says, let him who cannot be alone, let him who cannot be alone beware of community. But the reverse is also true. Let him who is not in community beware of being alone. What he's trying to say, what he's saying, better than I'm going to explain it right now, is that um, if you don't know how to be by yourself, your identity is going to be um, swallowed up by your group. And your group might be unhealthy. Your group might be toxic. Your group might be racist. Your group might be, you know, classist. And if you don't have a self-understanding and your own thoughts, you're going to be swallowed up in that group. And so if you don't know how to be a person on your own, be wary of your tie to the group. On the flip side, if you're just antisocial and, and you're just, you just always want to be alone and you don't want to have any relationships and you don't want to be a part of a community, that's dangerous as well. That's dangerous as well. Because we do need one another to, to help us in self-discovery. And we're not meant to be alone. God did not design us to be alone. He created us for community. So um, if, you, if you don't have a community, then you're not fulfilling your purpose. You were created to be a blessing to other people. And if you're by yourself, um, that's very dangerous. Um, isolated people are vulnerable people. Isolated people are people that are in pain. Isolated people are ultimately dangerous people. So these two coexist, community and solitude. And um, let's, let's look at how we can do that. Practicing solitude. So solitude, solitude is not being alone. It's being alone with God. It's different from loneliness. Solitude is being alone with God. Solitude is not necessarily about how many people are around you, because you can practice solitude in a crowd. Even right now at church, I'm practicing solitude because I love you all and I'm a part of this church and this community, but in my heart, my utmost and first loyalty is to Jesus. And what I'm always doing is I'm checking with Jesus. In my spirit, I'm always just having fellowship with Jesus. It doesn't matter how many people are around me. It doesn't matter what they're doing. For example, you might come to church and you might think, hey, nobody else is worshiping. Uh, it's hard for me to worship. Just, just tune everybody out then and just be with Jesus. You can be, a, you can be alone with Jesus uh, on a bus. None of you take the bus. Uh, some of you take the bus, actually. Good for you. I, I wish LA had better public transportation. But you could be in solitude on a bus, you could be in solitude at a party, you could be in solitude at the supermarket. You can always practice this inner communion with Jesus that allows you to, you know, navigate crowds, other people, in, in a way that's peaceful. So you can practice solitude in a crowd. Um, find or create uninterrupted space. Go to a park. My favorite public space for solitude is ironically a crowded coffee shop uh, because nobody is there to bother me. Um, at home, 
there's always the chance somebody could interrupt me. At church, there's always the chance somebody could interrupt me. But at a coffee shop, nobody cares about me, nobody knows about me. That's, that's a great space. Um, set aside space in your home. If you're building a home, set aside a prayer closet, a prayer room. Make or find a space. It's not just that how many people are there, it's the fact that you'll be uninterrupted, right? That you, you'll be able to just be alone with God uninterrupted. Uh, the other thing that has really helped me is to journal. Um, maybe it's just the way I'm wired, but I often don't know what I think until I write it down. I don't, I don't even know what my opinion is. This is why I need to go away, because when I'm in crowds, sometimes um, I'm so intent on listening and hearing everybody else's opinions that I take it all in, and I need time away from the crowd and usually to write down what I'm thinking to arrive at my own conclusions. So journaling, for me anyways, is a type of prayer because I'm not, I'm not only writing my thoughts down, I'm writing what I feel like God is speaking to me. So these, there's many other ways that you can try it. You can go on a retreat, you can get away to the mountains, um, you know, in your car, on your commute. Just turn off the radio. Find that time to be alone with God. And um, express yourself honestly to Him. We all need space where we can honestly say what we think. Because I know that a lot of times what we think we can't say in public, right? What we're thinking we can't always tell even our family. What we're thinking we can't even always tell our spouse. But we all need space to be able to express those things. And to examine those things. Um, so, I think over time, when we practice solitude, uh, we become mature as Christians and as people. And the more mature we become as Christians and as people, the more of an asset we'll be to our community. And when cardia is filled with individuated people, when you all start discovering your purpose and your identity in Christ, and have the strength to stand for that, to say, no, I'm not C-3PO, I'm Qui-Gon Jinn, in Jesus' name, uh, then the stronger we're going to be as a church, and the stronger society becomes. So, get alone with God. Get alone with God. Let's pray. God, we, we face so many uh, pulls from so many different directions, so many different communities that we're part of, so many different friends, family, um, organizations we're part of, and they all might tend to pull us in different ways. They all shape us in different ways, and some of that is wonderful and good, but some of it can be unhealthy. And Lord, what we need from you is help to understand who we are, what we think. And only you can really give us that clear sense of who we are, of who you are, and of the truth. So this week, we ask that you would help us to steal away from the crowds, to steal away from the chatter, if even, in, if, if even just in our spirits, to steal away, to go into that inner sanctuary where we can have time alone with you. And in that time alone with you, as we practice that this week, I pray that you would meet us there. I pray that you would speak to us in our hearts. I pray that you would reveal to us who we are, reveal to us something more about who we are, Reveal to us something about your will for our lives, what you want us to do, who you want us to reach out to, how you want us to do our jobs, our school, our career, how you want us to engage with our family. In that space alone, we ask that you would lead us through the truth that comes from the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for that gift of the Holy Spirit living inside of us as we put our trust in Jesus. And uh, 
bless every single person here with that experience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's great to see every single one of you here. I, I see Rick, Donna, and Caden. Yeah. First time back in, in like months. I know. We miss you guys. We miss you guys. And we're so, I'm so thrilled that you're here.